Hi guys, welcome back. We're going to be solving the case study from the latest paper of the Feb March 2023 exam paper 2. Now before we start, I want you to pause this video and go in the description where you will find the case study question from this attempt. First read that question carefully and then come back to the video. Okay, so now let's read the first question. It says, using figure 1.1, compare the inflation rate between July and December 2020 with that between January and 2021. So basically this question is asking you to compare the inflation rate from July 2020 to um, June 2021 in the first six months and then you know in the last six months. So they have given you the inflation rate on the y-axis and the years on the x-axis and basically as you can see in this graph but this is basically a trend line as in it's sort of showing you the trend um, that is how the inflation rate was going up or down or you know how the inflation rate fluctuated between these uh, 12 months from June from July 2020 to June 2021 and basically these kind of questions do come in the exam this is specifically focusing on inflation rate but examiners usually test us regarding the uh, trends between you know the current account of deficits or surplus how the values have gone up and down or maybe they could give you a trend line of maybe the exchange rate or maybe you know a trend of uh, you could say real GDP or unemployment rates so these trends are usually tested and in this video I'm going to teach you how to analyze and uh, you know come out of a conclusion or make an analysis from these trends right so guys as you can see over here I have written down July to, July to December 2020 um, on the left hand side and then the Jan to June 2021 on the right hand side. Now you don't need to do that. You don't need to do this way in the exam. You can directly write the answer in, in one paragraph. But uh, right now my objective is to explain it to you guys. So I've written this way. So as you can see in the first six months from July 2020 to December 2020, the trend as in we need to assess what the inflation rate is. So if we see that at the start of July 2020, it was 1%, right? Inflation was 1%. And if you see and in at December 2020, the inflation rate is somewhere close to 1.4%, right? So it's somewhere around 1.4%, okay? So from 1% to 1.4%, the inflation rate has gone up. Now, usually what students will do or the mistake that they will make in the exam is that they'll start by saying the inflation rate in July was 1%, then in August it went, went up to around 1.3%, and then, you know, it went up to, let's say, in September it went to 1.4%, then it fell to 1.2%. So basically they will give you a month-by-month -month analysis. Now, a month-by-month -month analysis is not required at all. That's the wrong approach. It will disappoint your examiner. Uh, that is not how you do it. So when, whenever they were ask, whenever they are asking you to analyze the trends between certain periods, what you need to do is you need to sort of take the start value and the end value and, you know, generally see how has things, um, you know, been over the graph. So if I look at this graph, I can clearly see that in July 2020, the inflation rate was 1%, while in December 2020, it was 1.4%. So if I compare 1.4% with 1%, I can clearly see that the inflation rate has gone up. So the overall trend in the rate of inflation is an upward trend. So how do you define the trend? You'll say that this is an upward trend. Number That's the first thing that you will write. The second thing that you will write is that you'll say that the inflation rate has gone up from 1% to 1.4% in, in December 2020, right? And similarly, if you look at January to January to uh, June 2021, in January 2021, it was um, nearly like, you know, 1.4%, close to, yeah, it was 1.4%. And if you look at, um, um, you know, June 2021, it has gone up to somewhere around 5.4%, right? Uh, if you look at this, somewhere around, it's, yeah, it's 5.4%, right? So, so that's how you need to analyze the trend. So you say that in so you say that the you know the inflation rate has gone up from 1.4% to you know 5.4% in January 2021. Now, as you can clearly see that inflation rate over here in the first 6 months of this fiscal year, the inflation rate went from 1 to 1.4 while in the next 6 months it tremendously it sharply rose from 1.4 to 5.4. Now, the word sharply rose is again a description of the rate at which the prices were rising because when you are defined when you are analyzing these trends you don't need to only give the values or the rate at you know the the, the percentage increase in the inflation but you also need to give that adjective to you know what was the magnitude of that increase and in, in what were the extent of that increase how 
I mean, how fast or how slow were the increase? So the fact that how slow or how fast was it? Was it really fluctuating? Was it stable? Whether the increase was stable, whether the increase or decrease was the change in the prices was very much flux fluctuating, whether it was volatile, you need to explain that as well. So if you look at the trend of inflation between July to December 2020, you can see that it has been uh, sort of relatively stable because if you look at this analysis, you know, it went up and then, you know, it went a bit up further and then it went a bit down, but then it became constant and then it, you know, again reached to 1.4. So this sort of line, which is, you know, sort of uh, showing a very small or minor change, there hasn't been a lot of fluctuations. And even the, those fluctuations have been relatively stable, right? I mean, there have been a very, very minor increase and a very, very minor decrease. So overall, if you look at overall, if you sort of try to analyze this increase, I mean, this change, if you look at this pattern, this pattern, this is a relatively stable pattern, right? So when you are describing the analysis, when you are describing how the trend has been, so the second thing after, you know, writing those values, what you need to do is that you will say, guys, that you know, the, 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 the upward trend, although it has been upward, but it has been slowly upwards, right? It has gone up, but it has gone up very, very slowly, simple, smooth movements. So it has been slowly upwards. So you could also use the word gradually upwards. So apart from saying slowly upwards, you could also use the word gradually upwards. But if you look at the trend from Jan 2020, Jan 2021 to June 2021, you can see, look at this line. It, you know, it went up like this. And then suddenly, you know, first of all, this again, this sort of movement, I mean, this sort of movement, just a second, yeah, this sort of movement, this movement is a bit steep, and then it became more steep, and then it became more steep, and then it became a bit flat, and then it flattened out more, and then it sort of reached to 5.4%. But this sort of movement is this sort of increase, right? This movement is a steep movement, as in there has been overall, the overall picture is showing a steep rise in the inflation. So apart from just telling that the inflation has gone up from 1.4 to 5.4, you need to mention the magnitude or the pattern of that increase, which is representing um, a steep increase, right? Or you could use the word sharp increase or a rapid increase. You know, these three words would be good um, to use in your exam. So there has been a rapid rise. You could use the word, um, there has been a steep rise in inflation post Jan 2021, and there has been a sharp rise. So that's how you need to sort of analyze it, right? Um, and over here, you could say that, it had, that the rate has been, although the trend has been upwards, the inflation, which upward means that it has been increasing. The inflation has increased. It has not decreased. In fact, the overall inflation has increased from July to December. Although, you know, somewhere around September to October, it did go down. But overall, the inflation has increased. And I told you that you don't need to do the month by month analysis. Take the starting point and the ending point. And it, compare the starting with the ending. And you can clearly see that at the start, it was 1%. It, at the end, from where they're, the end of the month, where they're asking you to compare, the inflation rate was um, 1.4, which means that it has increased. Okay. So, but the increase has been slow, it has been gradual, it has been relatively stable. You could also use the word, um, the, it, it has been relatively stable. So, re relatively stable because, you know, the changes in the inflation weren't sort of, um, you could say, weren't sort of uh, uh, rapid, weren't sort of uh, highly fluctuating. They were stable. I mean, it was, indica it was indicative of price stability. The, the changes weren't really really uh, major there were sort of minor changes the, and minor changes sort of are indicative that relatively the prices have remained stable over the period of uh, you know july to december 2020 because just look at the movement like i said look at this sort of movement right okay so that's how you need to analyze it a lot of students do find um, trouble analyzing it and they don't know how to sort of give a picture and how to create a picture from these graphs and that's where my job kicks in right so this is how you need to sort of answer part A. But before I move on to part B, 
there are two three things that i want to tell you so first of all three things are required when you are analyzing trend be it uh, you are analyzing the trend of a current account deficit or a surplus if it is exchange rates inflation rates unemployment rates growth rates gdp growth rates first of all you need to tell the value the rate or value at the start and the rate of value at the end the second thing you need to tell is that overall what do you feel about that trend what do you feel about that that increase or decrease right has the rate gone up or down or let's say even if they ask you about let's say to analyze the current account balance um, you know in the period of 2 to 3 years then um has the so first of all apart from just saying has the deficit um improved or worsened maybe at the start it was this and maybe the deficit sort of worsened although in the middle it did improve but towards the end if you see that it has worsened then you know that's how you need to analyze those trends so but what has been the overall feel look like has it improved has it decreased has it worsened has it gone up or down um and then also apart from that you also need to tell um by looking at those graphs and trends that you know how bad or good the change has been i mean the magnitude of that change whether the increase or decrease was sharp steep uh, rapid slow gradual you know these words are very much um important um to use in an exam especially describing trends um, over the period of months or years right in fact what i'll do is that i'll take this opportunity right now to actually write down certain words that you guys can use in your exam which will help you master your case study analysis of these trends so guys the words that you can use while describing the trends whether the increase or decrease has been steep or you know shallow um or gradual so the different words that you can use is that you could say and this is irrespective of whether you are you know um men writing about or describing trends about the current account balance or the currency uh, depreciation or appreciation or the gdp growth rates or the unemployment employment rates right so, or the inflation rate so you could say if 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 you are saying that you know certain value has increased or whether the trend has gone up or the rates have increased the percentage have increased so you could say whether the increase has been a rapid rise or not because rapid rise usually happens when the trend line or the graph is suggesting that there has been a sudden and you know a significant increase so sort of a sudden and you know significant increase could um, could be you when when you can see from that from the graph so you could use the word rapid increase while analyzing the trend right another word that you can use is gradual rise and gradual rise you can use is when you're saying that although the rise there is a rise but the rise has been slow and steady right so you could say a slow but steady rise could sort of indicate in the graph or the percentage could indicate that the rise has been gradual then steady could also be used this is also another word that is used by economists you can say that a steady increase is basically a continuous increase that is it is increasing steadily as in you know it's going up and it's a continuous rise but it's consistent or you know it's stable as in it hasn't been really really steep um as in it's not that the rates have jumped really really fast so yeah there has been a continuous rise or maybe um even if it's declining so a steady decline could be used so the it has been continuous that it has been rising but it has been consistent i mean maybe the rates have been going up by let's say 1% 2% or let's say 3% but the increase has been consistent and um they have been stable right um so yeah the, in that case you can use the word um steady as well where you could say continuous but consistent or you know stable so these words could be used and number 4 is basically yeah so and if you're explaining let's say you're saying that there's a decrease so you could talk about whether the decrease has been if you're talking about a decrease so you know whether the decrease has been a slow decrease a slow decrease could basically be used when you're trying to say you know there has been a gradual and sort of steady decline so gradual and steady decline could indicate a slow decrease uh, at times the graphs show that there has been a decrease in the growth rates or maybe the inflation rates or whatever but that decrease is not slow in fact it's quite steep so a steep de- decrease or a rapid decrease could sort of indicate you know a significant drop a significant and sudden you know uh, drop right just like a steep increase could indicate a rapid rise right a rapid increase the word where i used a rapid rise it could also be used like a steep rise okay so so you need to know these because when you are analyzing these trends and these percentages um another word that you could use is let's say moderate 
decline or a moderate uh, you know decrease a uh, moderate decline shows a slow a slow decline as in you know the decline has been slow so a slow decrease or a moderate decrease is somewhat similar a slow but sort of steady decline right so these are different words all economic words that you can use to analyze these uh, graphs also remember that when you are analyzing these lines you know when you are analyzing these trends and these percentages you must also notice that you apart from just mentioning the start and the end date i mean the start and the end value and whether the rise has been upward or downward and then what's the magnitude of the rise i mean you know you need to use an adjective against it as in whether it has been sharp steep gradual steady whatever but you also need to analyze where i mean as far as whether these values uh, the increase or decrease in these values have been stable or they have been fluctuating this is an, an important thing to analyze apart from just analyzing um, the values and apart from just analyzing whether the trend has been upward or downward and apart from just analyzing whether it has been a steep rise or a shallow rise or a rapid or a significant decline whatever it is but as an overall picture you know if an overall graph is given so whether when you sort of look at that graph or when you look at that line is it an indicative of a picture that is that is representing stability as in the fluctuations were not really really bad as in they were not significant and you feel that there has been a stable it is showing stability as in there have been changes but not that significant or minor changes so that is indicating stability or you would feel that you know by looking at the graph there has been you know significant fluctuations right because this is also important to analyze as far as the fluctuations and whether they are indicative of volatility in them or whether they are indicative of stability in them because that really has an impact on different macroeconomic indicators because for example um stable rate of inflation or a values stable values or stable rates of inflation or growth rates or let's say employment or unemployment rates would be when the graph or the values uh, remains relatively constant over time right so in that case if they are relatively constant over time they are fluctuating but very small fluctuations very small minor fluctuations are indicative of stability whether that stability is in terms of prices inflation or employment or gdp rates over time uh while you could also say that while you could also argue that the fluctuating rates if those rates are fluctuating over time or the values in the graph show different fluctuations and if you see that there are many irregular ups and downs like for example if this is a let's say if you see you know this is a growth rate graph where you see that you know uh the growth rates have been sort of you know increasing increasing and then decreasing and then you feel that you know it went up again now this is sort of indicating a picture of uh, you know it, it it is sort of indicating a picture where these ups and downs have been quite irregular because we can't really assess if for example this is year 1 here and then this is year 2 here so between this one year there has been a lot of ups and downs we can see and this is sort of volatile fluctuations uh, i mean it's difficult to sort of predict what's going to happen next because there's a lot of uncertainty bleeding here right so if there are sort of the, so if these fluctuations in values or trends show rapid changes as in these are rapid changes you see the values going up quick and then going down and then up and so these are irregular ups and downs as in you sort of if you see a graph like this these are irregular ups and downs that are indicating um massive severe rapid fluctuations you could say and these rapid fluctuations economists sort of call them as volatile changes which sort of are irregular and they are unpredictable you know sudden changes rapid changes that also result in uncertainty right so as as an economic student when you are giving an exam and when you are analyzing these changes you must always tell the examiner that you are the king in the paper right you are different from all the rest and in order to be different from the rest you need to know the key you need to know where to hit the nail guys okay so now let's move on to part b of the question so guys part b of the question says that using information provided explain what is meant by the us government's economic stimulus package but before i move on to part b i just wanted to sort of you know just summarize the case study for you guys so i have written down a few summary points i'll quickly run through it so first thing what's happening in the case study is that uh, it says that there's a sudden boost in in basically consumer spending there's a sudden shock positive demand shocks so that these are overnight boost to ad um and your consumer spending is going up by 10% that's what the case study suggests uh, 
annually basically then obviously that would definitely result into inflation and the case study also talks about that there's a steep rise in inflation of around you know 5.4 percent it's you know jumped to 5.4 percent while it was expected that it would be much less which means that much of the ex inflation that has arise is basically unexpected as the paragraph suggests then as we said as we discussed that inflation is rising and there have been two reasons to it one is one of the reasons that is mentioned is on the demand side the other is on the supply side the demand side reason talks about that there has been increase in consumer spending consumer expenditure while the while another reason uh, demand side reason mentioned that there is an increase in government spending um that is the fiscal stimulus that the us government has given to boost economic growth that has resulted into a budget deficit of somewhere around 20.7% of your gdp and then you have some supply side issues given as well such as raw material short shortages of essential raw material shortages due to the blockage of the suez canal and then it talks about that the cost of production the transportation cost is going up when goods and services are shift, uh, shipped from china to the us that will definitely cause cost push inflation and then <clears throat> it also talks about that uh, the government is um, implementing the central bank is basically considered to implement a tight monetary policy which is a contractionary monetary policy where you know after the implementation of that monetary policy your interest rates would go up and the objective is to cool the economy down now i want you to understand that the word cool the economy down is written in the case study and there's a reason behind why this word has been used because it talks somewhere around over here that you know in order to cool the economy down over here right so for as high it talks about the inflation will rise um, the interest rates may need to rise from 0.25 to somewhere around 4.5% to cool the economy down there's this is a big jump of interest rates basically that the us central bank will make and the reason why the word cool down has been used it's the opposite of heating right so usually in economic terms we say that the economy is overheating and when it becomes when the heating of the economy gets too much we use the word overheating usually when the economy exceeds the level of full employment of output where the inflation just you know gets out of control so when you when you when you're talking about the word that cool down it's basically talking about the word that there has been a rapid rise in economy uh, inflation that is basically causing the economy to heat itself and that's why uh, because obviously the government had given you know there was a rapid rise in consumer spending and then a couple with you know fiscal stimulus packages uh, definitely the economy was sort of heating and the inflation rates were shooting up so that's the reason why you know it's mentioned in the case that tight monetary policy is implemented to cool the economy down that is to bring the ad down right now coming to part b of the question which obviously says that uh, what is meant by <clears throat> what is meant by the us government's economic stimulus package so economic stimulus package guys is basically an implementation of your um expansionary fiscal policy um it's also known as fiscal stimulus and uh, basically what happens is that the uh, government's objective one of the macroeconomic objective is to boost economic growth and reduce unemployment so economic stimulus packages are basically these deliberate attempts to you know boost growth in order to reduce unemployment and bring the economy out of recession and you know reduce the slowdowns in the economy through deliberate expansionary uh fiscal policy or you can say through discretionary fiscal policies which are expansionary in nature and it's also known as fiscal stimulus right like i've written down over here as well and these policies the 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 economic stimulus basically consists of cutting down your taxes to boost consumption and increasing uh, your government spending uh, which represents we know that government spending is basically an injection into the circular flow of the economy that will cause it to rise so that's one of the explanations that you can give about what an economic stimulus package of the government means right but then that's not the only thing that but see you also have to give the reference to the case study as well that for example the case mentions about the amount of the um government the, the amount by which the government spending the government the us government has injected the stimulus into the economy you know which is around 6.6 trillion um in the year 2020 2021 which obviously caused a budget deficit of 12.7% of gdp now why did it cause a budget deficit because definitely when the government spending would go up it does cause a you know a budget deficit because already the us economy has been um recovering trying to recover from the covid slowdowns and recessions and definitely which means that tax revenues must be much lower and uh, you know now in order to fund that government spending it did, and it would result into a budget deficit and you know to fund that 
uh, the government would need to definitely borrow. So this fiscal stimulus usually involves, uh, as you know, government borrowing as well, in order to finance those deficits by issuing bonds to the private sector and commercial banks. And uh, it's 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 also known as debt fueled uh, fiscal stimulus. Now, probably you don't need to mention that in a four mark, in a two mark question for case study. But yeah, I was just letting you know so that you could maybe you know in a past paper paper two question this would help you write. Uh, you, you can use these words to write your answer. Now, part C says that consider the extent to which an increase in interest rates could reduce the rate of inflation in the U.S. Now, it's a policy question. The, first of all, remember that whenever questions like assess whether or assess to what extent or consider to what extent or maybe discuss whether or discuss in general uh, discuss questions as well all these questions require you to evaluate the narrative whatever the na whatever narrative the question is suggesting you to do right so for example the question it has given us a narrative or the question wants to take us a narrative and to explain that narrative that how a rise in interest rates would reduce the rate of inflation in the economy so if you are evaluating that narrative you need to you know, place an argument against that narrative that when will it not or when will it not be effective or to what extent will it be effective, right? So in this question, you need to analyze the narrative and then evaluate that narrative as well. So when you're analyzing it, you need to give an in-depth explanation of how an increase in um, interest rates could reduce um, inflation, creating that chain of analysis and then evaluate that uh, narrative by giving a counter narrative that when will it not because maybe it would depend upon certain factors. Right. So, for example, first of all, remember that when um, interest rates in the U.S. economy would go up when central banks would increase interest rates, um, basically it's an example of tight monetary policy or contractionary monetary policy. Right. Remember that because interest rates are the main mechanism or interest rates are the main tool for um, uh, causing, uh, you know, creating that um, transmission mechanism or, you know, affecting various variables occur, um, across the economy by going through a transmission mechanism and then creating those changes in those variables across the economy by reducing aggregate demand, basically. And like the case suggests that it wants to cool the economy down and the objective is to reduce aggregate demand and that is why, because the case suggests that there has been a rapid rise in inflation, so that is why we know that a rapid rise in inflation is not good, it is undesirable because it could cause the economy to possibly overheat. And that's unsustainable and undesirable. And that is why you are implementing an expansionary monet I mean sorry, a contractionary monetary policy. So guys, in your analysis, what you will write is that an a rise in interest rates, first you will say that a rise in interest rates is an implementation of uh, <coughs> contractionary monetary policy. And then you will explain how would this actually work. And how will this work is, so first of all, a rise in interest rates would increase the cost of borrowing. But we need to see how the rise in interest rates would sort of work across uh, different variables or affect different variables um, in the AD equation by bringing up and finally bringing upon a change in the aggregate demand. And that is exactly what the transmission mechanism of monetary policy is. So what's basically going to happen is that as interest rates go up, first of all, it is going to increase the cost of borrowing. That is, it will make it expensive for consumers to borrow and increasing the opportunity cost for consumers to borrow money. And, you know, consumers would feel that now it's difficult for them to borrow and then spend money on maybe buying cars, houses and furniture, right? Or maybe spending on needs and wants. And this would reduce the consumption expenditure in the AD equation and shifting the aggregate demand to the left. And when AD goes down, inflation rates would go down, right? The second thing how inflation, uh, sorry, the second way in which how a rise in interest rates would affect your um, inflation is or how would it bring the inflation down is that again it is going to increase. So basically interest rates are also returns on savings as well for people who deposit money in banks and earn interest on it. So an increase in interest rates would basically increase those returns on savings, which simply means that it is going to increase the incentive to save, right? And instead, the incentive to spend or borrow money would go down. And as a consequence, what's going to happen in the economy is, in the U.S. economy, is that the saving ratio in the U.S. economy would start to go up, which will again reduce consumer spending, right? And then again, it will affect the consumption expenditure in the AD equation by bringing down uh, the AD from 81 to 82. Um, you p don't need to make the diagram because it's a four mark question, but yeah, you need to know that it's going to reduce the aggregate demand. So, but again, it's not just, you know, you don't, you don't need to just write in the exam that a rise in interest rates increases cost of borrowing and it reduces AD. You need to explain that mechanism, how that rise in interest rates hits different variables throughout the economy, right? 
before bringing a finally decline in aggregate demand then a rise in interest rates would also increase those monthly payments on um, on those variable mortgage rates we know about mortgages are that is house loans it would also affect them for people who have taken mortgages right they have those house house loans on their head knocking their head all the time and those house owners or home owners will feel that their disposable incomes are now going down since the variable mortgage rates are going up which would again reduce uh, consumption in the economy um, as less people would take house loans and this would again reduce the consumption in the ad equation right the fourth way in which interest rates could affect the ad um, or reduce inflation in the economy is that as i said that inflation it's the cost of borrowing for consumers is not the only um, is not the only cost for consumers that go up in fact interest rates are also going up for the firms as well right so as interest rates for firms go up the cost of borrowing for firms will go up as well which will make it difficult for them to borrow money and as a result for firms the marginal propensity to invest for firms would go down now it's up to you to use this word marginal propensity to invest if you use it it's fine if you don't it's fine either ways right i usually use it so it's up to you so um um and then what's going to happen is that as firms invest less then the investment expenditure in the ad equation goes down from ad1 to ad2 right and then there's a, a there's another way in which aggregate demand would go down uh, reducing inflation rate is that is through the effect of interest rates on your exchange rates right and this is one factor i have noticed while checking the exams that usually students miss out right they miss out the fact that interest rates have an impact on exchange rate by affecting the demand for the currency so when interest rates when us interest rates would go up it is basically going to increase the relative us interest rates you relative us interest rate simply means that the interest rates of us are compared with other countries so the relative as the relative interest rates you, uh, in the us go up and make sure that you use this word relative so as a relative us interest rates would go up it would make it make foreign financial investors um, more attractive towards us in, you know us uh, banks since it would make it attractive for foreign financial investors to deposit money in us banks and the us financial institutions as obviously those investors are always chasing for better interest rates and better returns right and that is going to result into hot money inflows into the usa which will basically increase the demand for the pound so as more money comes into usa definitely the investment would take place for the financial investment in banks would take place and other financial institutions would take place in dollars so the demand for dollars will go up um as more foreign currency is converted to dollars right to make that deposits in the banks and that will appreciate the currency and the subsequent impact of appreciation we know guys is that it reduces the price of imports and it increases the price of exports right assuming that the pd for exports and imports is elastic so what's going to happen is the price of imports go down the quantity of imports would go up and as the price of exports go up the quantity of exports would go down which would have an ex- uh, impact on import expenditure that import expenditures would go up right while export revenues would go down now import expenditures and export revenues are basically components of the ad equation simply it because when import expenditures go up and export revenues go down the x minus m or the net exports in the ad equation go down and net exports are another you know uh, net export spending is another component of the ad equation so when that goes down ad again goes down so that so these are the different ways in which interest rates reduce or a tight monetary policy actually works and this is exactly what you need to explain in the answer right now guys the question was asking about assess whether um, the monetary policy uh, would be effective in the sense that to what extent would the rise in interest rate reduce the rate of inflation right so which definitely means that now you need to evaluate as well so i've written down a few points that you could give for evaluation then you could say that you know the extent to which the interest rates would actually be effective in reducing the rate of inflation would depend upon a few factors such as it would depend upon what is the level of consumer and business confidence so if the level of consumer and business confidence is very high um where you know they are really confident about the future state of the economy and the fact that their future employment prospects are secured and their future business prospects are secured as well so in that case a rise in interest rate would not reduce aggregate demand because despite the fact that cost of borrowing is 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 going up still consumers and firms might you know borrow and spend because of the fact that confidence would overshadow or offset the fact that the cost of borrowing is rising and consumers and borrow, consumers and firms will still be willing to consume and spend hence the the 
this would sort of reduce um, the fact, the effectiveness of the monetary policy in reducing um, inflation, because this so which obviously means that there's no guarantee that a rise in interest rate would end up you know reducing inflation because of the fact that it also depends upon the level of consumer and business confidence. You could mention that. Also, guys, you could also say that you know it depends upon the size of the interest rate cuts. Maybe if the interest rate cut is huge, then it will have a bigger impact. Although in this case, it does seems huge because you know they 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 have mentioned about the fact that there would be a huge uh, rise in interest rate yeah so basically it says that you know it's expected to rise from you know 0.25 to you know as high as 4.5 percent so that's a huge jump in interest rate so in that sense yes it would be effective then because the interest rate rise is uh, sort of quite high so in that sense yes it could be effective to an extent but it depends upon other factors as well. You could also say that it also, there are time lags involved as well. Now, what does time lags mean? It simply means that, you know, the, there are time lags uh, for interest rates uh, to have an impact on the economy. Um, and, you know, it's a widely accepted uh, phenomena that interest rates could, you know, take two years to have a full impact on the wider economy because uh, it takes time, a change in interest rate takes time to, you know, fully, um, fully feed through the different channels of the transmission mechanism before it uh, ends up uh, either increasing AD or reducing AD, right? And it, it you could also say it also takes time for consumers and firms to actually react to changes in interest rates, right? So if you're looking for immediate, uh, probably if you're looking, looking for immediate short term reduction in AD, then it might, it will not happen. Don't write that. You you say it might not happen to the extent that we expect it to happen, right? Also, you could also uh, use another evaluation here. You could say that although, yes, monetary policy might be effective in reducing demand for inflation, but demand side factor is not the AD is not the only reason why inflation is occurring in USA it's one of the it's also the fact that inflation is occurring because of cost push reasons as in there's cost push inflation as well due to increase in uh, due to you know supply chain disruption of supply chain and also the fact that the cost of shipping goods uh, from from China to USA is going up which is causing increase in cost of production in the economy causing cost push inflationary pressure as well so that will not be so sorted out because of a tight monetary policy now I've given three four points for evaluation but you you know a one point could be enough um, regarding an evaluation for a four mark question because you also need to see the number of marks for the question and even for analysis I gave a huge explanation for the analysis so so you know possibly for a four mark question you might not need to end up writing so many points for evaluation maybe you could give this point regarding the cost of borrowing for consumers you could also give the point but do mention definitely you could you could go away or live without writing the fact about variable mortgage rates but yeah the for a and b and d and e a b d and e are super important but if i was you i would have written c depending upon how you know good or great my writing speed is and depending upon how much confidence i have that i'll be able to end the exam on time let's move on to the next question now okay guys so part d of the question says that with the help of adas diagram assess whether rising inflation rate in the u.s has been caused by changes to the demand side or changes to the supply side of an economy so basically they are saying that whether inflation they're asking us that whether inflation has been caused by um, the fall in as or a rise in ad now or it's or whether inflation is due to demand side factors, whether it's demand pull or cost push inflation. So they're asking us assess whether. Now assess whether, remember, involves evaluation. And then it also, we also need to sort of form a judgment in this sort of a question. Because we need to assess whether it is, because, the, because here the assessment is either this or this, or it could be both maybe as well, right? So we need to form that judgment as well. Now, for a question like this, you could start off by defining what inflation is, that it is a rise um, or a sustained rise in a general level of prices over a period of time. And then you could l do link it with the case that, you know, the inflation rates has sharply or rapidly gone up from December 2020 to June 2021. That is hitting 5.4%, which was the highest ever since 28, 2008. Because we need to sort of create a background to and then ultimately lead us to the answer. That's, that's how I will write in the exam. And I'll say that, you know, this, this inflation is basically a combination of demand pull and cost push inflation, both. 
where uh, you write that you know rapid shocks uh, rapid demand shocks uh, and rising rises to the consumer spending which is also coupled with accompanied with fiscal stimulus packages of the government which involved increasing government spending and reducing taxes that has caused your aggregate demand to shift outwards to 82 so don't just say that ad has increased from 81 to 82 do mention why has this gone up so first you tell about the consumer spending because the case clearly mentioned that there has been a tremendous sharp increase in consumer spending um, and then it also talks about the fiscal uh, stimulus packages of the government where 10 6 trillion i guess 6 trillion something was sort of uh, yeah so basically um, a coupled with a uh, you know increase in government spending injection of 6 trillion dollars uh, would definitely cause demand for inflation while at the same time you say that there has been supply side reasons as well such as um, you know supply disruptions of major raw materials like let's say timber for instance and this has been accompanied by with rising cost of transport cost because the transportation um, uh, has the transport cost has tremendously gone up because transport cost is a major barrier and it causes supply chain issues. I mean, it causes cost issues basically. And then it feeds through the economy as well in the form of higher cost push inflation. And what will this happen? This will result in negative supply shocks causing SRAS to fall to SRAS2 as shown in the diagram below. So now you sort of make a background and then you say that ultimately this has been diagrammatically represented in the below diagram. And then you just don't make the diagram. You sort of explain it on the right side or you know down below. You also need to frame an explanation or the analysis of that diagram so here basically i've made an ads diagram and what's happening here is that inflation is the result of both demand pull and cost push factors right so you need to shift the aggregate demand to the right and also shift the aggregate supply to the left right now first of all one thing is very important so you label the diagram properly you make these shifts properly proper shift don't make crooked lines draw it with a you know scale so the price level will go up from p1 to p2 so there, there's a drastic increase in price level because if it was only demand per in, if it was only demand per inflation then price level would be somewhere around you know here it would have been somewhere pa but now since it's cost push as well so the effect has been multiplied in time in, in terms of the increase in prices right so but you i would suggest you to keep the real gdp the same because we don't really know that what is the magnitude of the shift or the extent of the shift in ad and as we don't know that whether the extent of the increase in ad is more or the extent of the shift in as is more so although if if the ad shifted outwards to a larger extent than a decline in your sras let's say then overall real gdp would have gone up so let's say if it was somewhere like somewhat like this if this would have been an ad and this would have been your sras right and aggregate demand would have increased outward to a much larger extent let's say let's say while SRAS would have you know fallen to somewhere here then you know still your um, real GDP would have still gone up from Y1 to Y2 well price level would have definitely gone up there's no second um, explanation to it but yeah real GDP would have gone up as well because the positive magnitude as in in terms of AD dr driving your real GDP up increasing your real GDP would that effect would have offset the fact that your price is falling i mean your real gdp will fall due to a fall in sras right so we don't really know that because there's no clear information about that so it's best to in when you know you have a question like this where you have both demand pull supply side factors cost push factors so you make your real gdp use, so it's it's simply representing uncertainty at the moment regarding you know we don't really know the effect on real gdp so what i've written as far as the analysis of the diagram is concerned is if what i've written is that first of all price level goes up from p1 to p sorry p1 to p2 which obviously has the effect of both demand pull and cost push inflation in it right and as ad goes up we know that firms will expand output so you need to analyze demand pull inflation as well you don't just say that because the ad is going up price level rises but how does price level rise if ad goes up why is price level rising you need to explain that and the reason is that when ad goes up firms expand out output and in order to expand output the new that puts pressure on your existing or scarce factors of production which drives up the factor prices right and as factor prices go up then firms need a higher price to incentive in, in as in as factor prices goes up firms need to transfer that factor prices on consumers right and as a result that feeds through the economy through higher demand for inflation that's one reason there's another reason that you could give as well that as firms increase output that sort of drives up the factor prices and it drives up their cost then firms need a higher price to incentivize production right so that's simple that's a simple logic so definitely you know prices then start rising in the economy as firms you know increase output and 
it feeds through a high demand for inflation. At the same time, you need to also tell that, you know, the cost is tripling in terms of the transport cost. It says that it has tripled over the period of, you know, it has been the highest uh, in terms of somewhere mentions that it has, uh, you know, tripled uh, to uh, somewhere around. Uh, yeah, it has the cost of shipping goods from China to US has tripled over 12 months, right? which shows a tremendous rise in your cost of production three times as um, as from previous which and as at the same time there are supply chain issues uh, as well which is obviously causing a further fueling um, in the price level and you could say that the impact on real gdp at the moment is uncertain so that's how you sort of explain through your ads diagram that how demand for inflation is occurring and then give it give reference to the to the case study as well but the major important part over here is that you guys should not miss out is the fact that you need to sort of form a conclusion that whether this um, inflation has been more on the demand side or the cost side and I have framed a conclusion that is how I would write in the exam where I have you know instead of making an objective statement I've sort of taken a, you know a middle road um, I would say where I have not put myself at a big risk while writing a frame a conclusion and that is exactly a technique that I'm going to be teaching you over here that how you need to sort of frame that so for example what you need what you could write in the exam is that you could say that for instance to conclude inflation in 2021 is the result of both demand pull and cost push inflation that is both demand side and supply side reasons from the information that is given it seems like so from the information that we have obviously so from the information that they gave us it seems like it seems like it's not clear to us we don't know but it seems like it is more of the of the demand side why because i have my reason to it because i'm if i'm saying this and i'm also giving a reason to it because i feel that while reading the case study that um, they are they have mentioned in the case study that they are coming up with contractionary or tightening monetary policies which is obviously the objective is to reduce ad they haven't mentioned that if there is if, if there has been cost push inflation or the cost of shipping has going up so they didn't mention that they are giving probably they are reducing taxes or giving subsidies to sort of reduce the impact of the rising cost they only mentioned about policies to uh, the, the the monetary policy to control ad they didn't talk about the supplies the the sorry they don't talk about the policies to cut down the cost for those firms in terms of transportation cost by pro i don't know maybe providing um some sort of better infrastructure or maybe some sort of uh, um tax reductions or subsidies to reduce their cost you know so they they, they didn't mention that so that's one evidence um, although this evidence is not really solid this evidence is weak and this there is and by the way you could mention that this evidence is not solid this evidence is weak you can that is all what evaluation ultimately leading to a conclusion or a judgment is all about that is what examiners are testing you that what sort of understanding can you develop out of a case study right so again when you feel that when you feel in the exam that okay fine the evidence sort of is weak then mention that it's weak it's not a problem it's okay but if you are 100% confident it is weak then you can mention that right exact remember that for questions like these there would no there would not be a one fixed answer which fits for all right because these are normative opinions and it would vary but then the examiners are looking for the right logic that you have given if your logic is right it will be awarded also they talk about the fact that there has been booms and you know there has been a rapid rise in inflation rate where they brag about the fact that consumer spending has been excessive and then they also brag about the fact that um, they stress over the fact in fact that there has been stimulus packages and all which is again giving uh, much indication about rising ad um, on a greater magnitude and then they only talk about rising cost in one paragraph and then they don't even say that you know this has been a big concern for the government and then they move on to the fact that you know the uh, um, we want to sort of come up with a tightening monetary policy to cut down ad right so from that we can make a conclusion but how do you need to write that answer the, the way you're going to write that down i want you to see that very carefully and if you're by the way guys if you're following it if you're following whatever i'm teaching you i want you to comment that because i need to see the comments because at least i would know that yes whatever content i'm providing it's working on you and you're understanding it so basically then you need to come up with the fact that what you can write is that from the information that is given so the, this is how you need to come up with from the information that is given it seems like the government is coming up with monetary policy tightening to reduce ad 
which gives us an indication it gives us an indication we're not certain but it gives us an indication that demand side factors may have contributed more to demand for inflation as there's no mention is made by the us government to come up with policies to reduce cost and increase sras hence we can you know indicate so again now very carefully look at this what i've written now this provides us with some if not all it provides us with some evidence or hint if not all or it provides us with a reasonable amount of evidence to derive a conclusion to derive a conclusion that yes it might be it again i'm saying it might be don't say it will be it might be it may be more on the demand side factors but then again i have not ended my answer over here there's another thing in order to sort of stay safe in the exam there's another thing that i've written and that i've written that and look at the way that i've written then i've written that but on the deeper side but on the deeper side of perspectives that what i've written is that there is insufficient information in the case study to derive a clear conclusion as what has had the greatest impact on inflation so in that sense we could say that there is so in that sense you could say that it's a combination of both because there is insufficient information on a more deeper on a greater level so we could conclude our answer by saying that it could be a combine it is a combination of both instead of being very objective and blunt on no it's a demand more or to supply supply more just take a uh, a middle way by saying that it could be a combination or it is a combination but then there should be a reason why you're saying this you're saying this because based on the fact that you know you don't find reasonable or sufficient evidence to con- to make a direct conclusion although you did find some evidence and you mentioned that you know on the in the upper side the over here that you know we did find some evidence but that evidence was reasonable not really clear but it was some evidence right but on the greater perspective we could say that there is we could conclude that there's no sufficient information to make a direct conclusion okay so the last part of the case study says that assess the possible consequences of a rising rate of inflation for a country such as the us now whenever a question on consequences comes for anything remember that um consequences does not only means negative consequences right so it could also mean positive consequences it does means positive consequences so inflation also does have some positive consequences so you need to tell both the consequences um so for a question like this also now i want to take the opportunity to sort of explain the consequences of in- inflation in detail so i'm going to be explaining the points which will be relevant to this question but i would sort of bring in more detail so that i could sort of cover this topic of consequences of inflation somehow try to complete this uh, do whatever best of my abilities so basically uh, you could start off by saying you you don't need to define inflation if you already define it in part d right so you could say that a rising inflation rate could have both positive and negative consequences for the us and um much of it also depends on obviously whether this inflation is cost push or demand for inflation in the economy um central banks for the us such as the fed um that is the federal reserve the fed's target is low and stable inflation that is 2% and that is also mentioned in the case study over here that the target for the inflation uh for the F- the us central bank that is the fed is how much it is 2% uh it is targeted annual inflation rate of 2%. Also remember that 2% is the mild inflation rate which is indicative of price stability and that is why most central banks usually target 2%. Also remember that you could say that if inflation becomes too high it can sort of get undesirable. So yeah the fact that inflation gets too high out of control it could become undesirable for an economy. So undesirable is another word that is negatively associated uh with inflation yes you can sort of you know mention that so i've listed on the possible negative consequences for the us uh, that will have uh, if the inflation uh, sort of gets uh, high and it could be that for example you know with inflation the first of all the first disadvantage that you can give is that it results into the falling of the purchasing power now you need to explain what that means and remember that purchasing power falls when the wage rise is lagging behind the price rise which means that you know wages are not rising in line with inflation and overall as well the purchasing power is deteriorating because of a rise in cost of living as well and while while analyzing this point you could say that especially those people who are on fixed incomes they will suffer the most because of a decrease in their real incomes due to inflation and as a consequence their spending power would go down it would reduce tremendously which will decrease the consumption in the economy and it would have a negative effect in terms of welfare in terms of living standards and desirability as well and it would definitely affect the poor people right 
So you can mention that point. Another point that you could sort of mention is the fact that inflation basically redistributes income. Now I've written that in the second as a last point, but I'm going to be I want to explain this first. So because it is one of the most important negative consequences, so inflation redistributes incomes. Remember away from those people who are on fixed incomes and those who are in a weak bargaining position, and it redistributes it. It takes the income away from them and it redistributes it to the to those people who can use their economic power to. Sort of gain uh, large increases in their pays, in their rents, and in their profits because they ha- they are from a high socio-economic background and they have the power to make sure that their wages are rising in line with inflation. So inflation is sort of eroding in uh, eroding the living standards of the poor while not damaging or maybe increasing the living standards of the rich even during times of inflation because they have that economic power to gain you know large increases in pay, rents, and profits. So and also remember that inflation not only it redistributes income, it also redistributes wealth as well. In terms of you know, it redistributes wealth of you know to those people um, with assets and with properties that are increasing in value due due to inflation. Remember that prices for the property will go up during inflation and they will rise in value maybe rapidly uh, during periods of inflation. So it redistributes the it redistributes wealth to those people. Uh, who have those assets and who have those properties that are rising in value and it uh, you know f- away from sort of away from um, you know it redistributes well to those people and it re- and it away from uh, you know those people who only who, away from those poor people uh, or those unemployed people or those maybe people on pensioners who have who are only relying on savings who have their money that is deposited in savings uh, that is already paying a rate of interest that is below the inflation rate right and and that is eroding the value of their savings so those poor people who have deposited money in banks and are earning interest so their interest rates are low um, as compared to the inflation in the economy and that is eroding um the value of their savings um and again if uh, eroding the value of their wealth and the wealth is redistributed in the sense that the wealth is moving away from people who are poor because their wealth is going down while the wealth for the rich uh, and those people who have a lot of lots of properties and houses and buildings their wealth is going up because property prices are going up rapidly in, you know in, in in during times of inflation and the same thing might also happen in the us as well so you could write this point with, with respect to us and you could also write this point with respect to generally as well so so remember that when you are talking about uh, inflation as in term in the sense that it redistributes incomes so do talk about the fact that inflation redistributes income away from those people on fixed incomes and in a weak bargaining position to those who can sort of use their economic power to make sure that their profits and wages are rising and also it redistributes wealth away from those people who have deposited their money in savings and earning a l- low rate of interest than inflation that is the real rate of uh, interest is very low or maybe negative or extremely low that they're not really better off and to those people whose property prices and wealth is increasing because of inflation right so that has a negative regressive effect of inflation that's basically and also remember that inflation also have a, has a regressive effect on those people who are on lower income families uh, because we know that most because most of their like i said most of their wealth people who are in who are low income families their wealth is basically you know in the form that is held in cash and this is sort of linked with the, just the point that i told you because people on low income families their wealth is held in cash while people who are rich they have invested their wealth in properties right and those prices are rising so there is an unequal redistribution there's an unequal distribution of income and wealth taking place in the economy and this redistribution of incomes and wealth away from poor or low income families to rich families this is causing an this is causing living standards and relative poverty to worsen in the economy right also you could talk about menu costs that are involved uh, because of inflation because and uh, menu costs is where you know those um, uh, printing or reprinting of menus catalogs and labels they all need reprinting now and that's a substantial cost because of high inflation so the cost and these costs are substantial in terms of they require a lot of time they require a lot of labor costs involved and probably the physical cost of printing is also very high and as a consequence what what will happen is that since firms have to incur these costs which are menu costs 
again, firms will further increase the prices, which will further accelerate the rate of inflation in the economy. Or if you're linking it with the US, then yes, in the US economy. Also remember that there are shoe leather costs that the US economy might have to face, and these are those costs where what happens is that, as I said, during times of inflation, it sort of erodes the value of savings because the interest rate, because probably we are not really earning a positive uh, real interest rate, maybe because the inflation rate is more than the rate of interest that we are earning. So the rate of return, we're not earning a real positive rate of return. Maybe the real rate of return is negative and we are sort of worse off because of inflation. So what will happen is that individuals who are receiving a fixed interest rate on their savings will look for better places to now earn for positive real rate of returns, right? And if they look for better places, then how will they work? Maybe they need to take some day off from their work to sort of look and probably deposit money in better financial, on in other financial institutions and in other areas of financial instruments to sort of help them gain better rate of returns on that. Because return fixed returns on, because on savings they are getting fixed returns, which is, negative as in the real rate of uh, return on savings is negative because of the real interest rate being negative or maybe very low uh, because you know the inflation rate is much higher than the interest rate and that causes a large opportunity cost in terms of lost income for people because they might need to take a week off or a day off or two days off to sort of protect their value of their savings in order to sort of look for better places to now um, you know earn a positive real rate of interest and why am I saying this has an opportunity cost in terms of lost income? Because they could have used that time to probably work more productively in work. They could have used that time to probably do some more work or maybe work overtime and extra earn extra salary in their in their workplace, right? So they lose time from that productive work. So that is why the shoe leather cost involved. Now, if you look at in this era, obviously now you have digital banking and everything. So this point becomes less applicable now, but in theory, you need to write this point. Also remember that, like I said, savings are eroded in value because um, in terms of that, those savings that are earning a rate of return that is less than the inflation rate. So the savings will fall then. The savings are falling in real value, right? Because let's say that savings are earning a rate of return of 5% while the inflation is 9%. So I'm worse off by 4% in that case. And so if the, if the rate of return is less than the inflation rate, then savings are actually falling in real terms. In real terms, they're falling. In real terms, I'm not really gaining. I'm, I'm sort of worse off, right? Um, because the real rate is of return is negative. So... Now, the impact would be that for, for people in the U.S., this will reduce their incentive to save. And if their incentive to save goes down, then what about the people who are weak and unemployed and poor and probably economically inactive, and especially those who are old people work, living on pensions, they have saved their money in savings and deposits account and earning interest on, the, on them. So those people are actually relying on their living from those. They're actually relying on those savings and the interest earned from those savings to actually have a living out of it, right? So it will make them worse off, right? It will deteriorate their living standards and it will hit them bad. So also there is an economic point involved here as well that it is also going to, you know, reduce the amount of loanable funds available because if you save less, because peop if it will just like I said, it reduces the incentive to save. When incentive to save goes down, less people save then because they're like, why save when our real rates are negative and you know, it's eroding the real value of our savings, so why save then? So less people save and then if less people save, then banks will have less money to lend, which means that it is going to reduce the loanable uh, funds available with banks. And if banks have less loanable funds available to lend, it means that less lending uh, would be would take place in the economy, so less amount of loans would be lended to the businesses for investment purposes, which will reduce and depress the short-run um, economic growth as well as long-run uh, long economic growth. Because IE is an investment component, investment expenditure is a component of AD. So AD would go down because of that, depressing the growth rates, um, having a negative impact uh, on US uh, real GDP depressing short-run growth. Also, investment is a component of LRAS as well. It is also going to reduce, uh, it will also have a negative impact on long-run growth rates as well, as in long-term economic growth as well, right? Now, guys, another disadvantage that you can talk about is about, you know, inflationary spirals. And remember that um, anticipated inflation is a problem that if the inflation is anticipated, it would create inflationary spirals in the economy. That is, number one, wage price spirals as well, and consumer price spirals as well. Now, 
if now let, let's see how could it basically create wage price spiral so remember that if inflation becomes an anticipated or it is anticipated let's say then obviously workers are anticipating inflation let's say in the next quarter then workers will demand higher wages and the same would apply for us economy as well because as we know that inflation has already hit the us economy and if the workers in the us economy anticipate further inflation then workers will ask for higher wages to compensate for the fall in their purchasing powers right and if the firms accept such demands then this will increase the cost of production for firms and they will ultimately transfer this higher cost into higher prices which then feeds through the economy leading to sort of uncontrollable inflationary wage price spiral so and it could sort of become it could just spiral out of control as well and that is where it becomes so undesirable and unhealthy for the economy where it just becomes out of control right also remember that uh, inflationary spirals could also be consumption driven where we know that consumers are rational and if rational consumers who are anticipating inflation they will be like you know if prices will get if things will get goods and services will get more expensive in the future so let's start spending now so rational consumers who anticipate inflation will bring forward their spending now to protect themselves from the future price increases in the future right and so that they don't have to spend uh, or they don't have to pay higher amounts when inflation actually arises more in future so they will so this will increase the immediate consumption in the economy which will suddenly boost aggregate demand which will create new demand for inflationary pressures new sort of um, which weren't which weren't really um expected at the moment but because of an inflation expectation this suddenly happened that cons consumers started bringing forward immediate consumption and if imagine if all the consumers in the economy start doing that so it will create new demand for inflationary pressures leading to you say that they they will lead to consumer driven uh, you know price spirals where again inflation can become uncontrollable so that is again a negative impact on inflation you can use that for your uh, section c questions as well in your uh, essays and as far as obviously you could apply this to the us example as well in the case study also remember that when inflation is high and volatile it's it's just it's volatile means it's rampantly unexpectedly constantly changing and if it's high and volatile it's not good for the confidence of the economy especially for the confidence of the businesses because they cannot be sure what their costs and prices are likely to be now because it's constantly changing inflation is constantly changing and this uncertainty keeps them worried and this uncertainty also results into a fall in capital investment of the firms and if inflation is constantly constant inflation and volatile constantly volatile changing prices Uh, is substantially bad for the economy for business, especially if if the amount of investment that is done by the businesses go down because that reduces short term growth and long term growth prospects as well for the economy as real gdp would go down since investment goes down it reduces ad and and real gdp goes down as well as it has an impact on lras productive capacity in the economy could go down as well also remember that inflation results into a fiscal drag now what is a fiscal drag fiscal drag is where you know workers so let's say if you have if you're having demand for inflation where real gdp is going up we know that demand for inflation is associated with periods of higher economic growth and real gdp and as a result let's say um if uh, may, maybe let's say if workers wages are rising because workers are pushing for higher wages in order to match inflation and let's say that workers receive the workers actually receive a pay increase that matches matches their inflation right but that's a good thing for workers but then the problem is that that pushes them into a higher income tax band so because in a progressive income tax system we have tax bands right um higher income tax bands have higher marginal rates of ta income taxes so what it does is that it pushes them into a higher income tax band in a progressive income tax system and that income tax band is let's say right now not adjusted for inflation so in real terms they will end up paying more taxes and they and the individual is not better off with this pay increase because now they have to pay a higher marginal rate of income tax which will actually make them worse off than before and this is unfair to them and this can actually reduce the incentive for individuals to earn higher incomes if the tax bands are basically not adjusted yearly in accordance with inflation and that is where the problem of fiscal drag kicks in that it it just it just creates a uh, loss of incentive for people to actually work because if there is inflation then there should be the income tax band should be adjusted because of inflation because the government knows that ultimately workers will push for higher wages and they will some of them will get higher wages and they, it will push them into higher income tax bands and they'll end up paying higher marginal income tax rates and they will be worse off than before right 
this could reduce the incentive for individuals to earn a higher incomes affecting their productivity negatively impacting firms if their productivity loses and also productivity has an impact on the productive capacity or the economic growth in the economy so that is where the fisc- problem of fiscal drag is so um you know problematic right also remember that inflation could reduce the international competitiveness for us right because what inflation does is that the competitiveness of domestic exports will decrease the competitiveness of us domestic exports will decrease and us is a major exporter to a lot of different countries um which will reduce the demand and the revenues and generate from those exports um and obviously at the same time because domestic goods are expensive in us maybe imported goods in us will be more cheaper because people will feel firms and consumers will feel that imports are more cheaper so they'll import more because imports get more competitive relative to domestic goods which will increase the demand for imports and increase the impen- expenditure on imports as well so export revenues will be going down while import expenditures will be increasing hence reducing the net exports in the ad equation reducing the ad having having a depressing effect on ad and then having a depressive f- impact on real gdp uh, as well and this will be worst for those countries such as the usa who is also a major contra- exporter uh, to a lot of different countries right also and it would worsen the current account position for the usa increasing its deficits or you know um its trade deficits will rise so that's how in, in how that's how bad inflation can get also remember there is another disadvantage of inflation and that is the problem of inflationary noise the problem of inflationary noise is that um you know you need to understand that prices in the economy act as signals they are act as signals for consumers and firms the signal consumers and the signal firms what sort of signals do they give to firms is give signals to the firms regarding the relative scarcity of a given product which markets to enter which markets to exit and also they tell consumers they guide consumers on the utility uh, basically con- bas- basically they sort of give uh they they sort of um you know signal the consumers on the utility the consumers place on goods and services right and what happens is that if inflation is high right if inflation is increasing and especially if inflation is volatile not only high if it's volatile as well then individuals and consumers and businesses right they both will lose faith in sort of the signaling aspect of the prices of the price mechanism basically and they are confused with sort of in, they don't know how to interpret the price change whether whether we should take this price rise as a good thing as in something that we it the markets are expanding and we should you know enter the market and produce more and expand production or and consumers don't really know that whether we should sort of if the prices are rising so is it because we are placing a higher utility on it or maybe because um the prices are rising because of a rising cost of production or maybe because prices are rising because now this good is worth more it, it confuses them as well and if it confuse remember that when businesses and consumers are confused they will take irrational decisions and so consumers and firms both are confused about how to interpret those price changes and they are also don't understand why they keep on changing and this uncertainty is a problem because this uncertainty can put consumers off consuming they won't consume they don't know how much to consume now they might probably consume in wrong numbers and it also puts off businesses from investing as well right so it reduces ad and it reduces economic growth and hence reducing economic growth in the economy since c and i in the ad equation go down and real gdp falls also remember guys that inflation especially if it's cost push inflation because usa is also having cost push inflation hit by um disrupting of the supply of goods and services especially raw materials and also because of transportation cost rising cost push inflation has a worse of, of impact than demand per inflation because at least with demand per inflation your real gdp is going up you have economic growth um and your cyclical unemployment that is demand deficit unemployment is falling but with cost push inflation you are suffering from stagflation that is your unemployment is going up your price level is going up and your real gdp is going down and you can see this on the diagram as well that with cost push inflation you are sort of you know not only having lower economic growth but your real i mean your price level is going down your real gdp is falling you sort of have structural unemployment in the economy and this 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 the industry is the industries are shutting down because they can't survive this higher cost and that's a bad thing for the economy especially for its long term growth prospects for the usa 
which is known as stagflation as well. So this is bad for the economy. It's bad for USA. So the fact that, you know, you, you need to talk about the negative con- possible negative consequences. So you need to talk about the negative consequences, both as inflation in general, then sort of focus a bit on demand side. And then on, you know, as far may, may make sure that you mention uh, cost push inflation as well. Right. Also emphasize on the fact that whether it is high or volatile or w- what sort of inflation it is. But also remember that, you know, not inflation, not all inflation in the economy is bad for the U.S. economy and not all inflation is harmful, which means that inflation do have certain benefits as well for U.S. economy. It will have as well and in, 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 in general as well, especially remember that if inflation is low and stable and sorry, if inflation is low and stable and is demand for inflation, it remember that that inflation is beneficial because it's sustainable and it is also desirable for the economy since it is causing your economic growth to take place. Your real GDP is rising and basically you can see an upward movement on your short run aggregate supply curve and an upward movement on your short run aggregate supply curve is representing an extension in SRAS that simply means that firms are increasing output and when firms are increasing output they will hire more workers it will reduce your cyclical unemployment that is demand deficit unemployment increase economic growth result in higher GDP higher real GDP it will also increase the government's tax revenues as well and they can spend those tax revenues on providing more essential public services providing subsidies to probably firms essential firms key industries again resulting in economic growth from the supply and supply side as well and providing and investing in infrastructure and you know health and um, uh, education etc so this inflation is actually good for the economy but then also remember that you need to evaluate that it depends upon what the rate of inflation is you know if inflation just gets rampant out of control then even demand for inflation is not good especially if the economy starts to overheat it's not good okay now these points I'm going to be talk, telling you in general. Uh, you can apply in this question as well, but remember it's a six mark question. There's a limit to the amount that you will write. But like I said in the in the start as well, I will take this opportunity to, you know, give you all the content on inflation as possible I can get. I hope you're enjoying this video, and if you you are, then I would like to see your comment in the comment section as well. Also remember that demand for inflation, like I said, results in falling unemployment, economic growth, and tax revenues go up. So yeah, that's about it. As and in and, and and also the fact that. Um, also the fact that there's another benefit of inflation that uh, inflation will not only keep unemployment low but inflation also basically reduces the real value of debt now a lot of people don't really understand how this works so let me explain it also it also reduces the real value of debt now we know that debt is fixed debt could be mortgages it could be general loans it could be house loans um, car loans etc etc right so Overall debt, um, whether held by uh, government firms or consumers, would go down in the economy. I mean, the real value of the debt would go down. A simple reason is that since, um, since uh, especially during demand for inflation, we know that wages are rising in the economy um, because of higher, because more people are employed. So incomes are going up, national income is going up, government's tax revenues are going up, profits of the firms are also rising if if inflation is demand pull um, and it's 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 low and stable. Then, then this sort of uh, rise in incomes and wealth and uh, profits would would make it easier to service debt. That is the reason why the real value of uh, debt goes down. That is exactly what you need to rise, right? That it reduces the real value of debt because wages, revenues, and profits will rise in the economy, which will make it easier to service that debt in the economy, right? So that is one thing that you also need to. Um, right in the exam apart from just telling that tax revenues goes up and unemployment goes down there's more economic growth also remember that these advantages are linked with only demand for inflation not cost push inflation also remember that workers will enjoy as well because they because in demand for inflation they will sort of come up with you know so I in inflation they will push for higher wages and if they might get higher wages as well also remember they might some of the workers don't need to push for higher wages as in a lot of the unemployed workers will be employed as well because obviously when firms will expand output, there's an extension in SRAS and because of a rise in AD, firms are hiring more workers. So automatically the way more workers will be paid now. Initially they were unemployed, but now they will be employed. So overall incomes will rise and wages will rise in the economy and workers will enjoy the pay increase, right? Even if the in- in pay increase is only limited or just matching a small, or if, even if its increase is only small to match the inflation increase or the price increase but the the good part about a wage increase is that it keeps the workers productivity high and it also remember that it 
and also remember that workers are workers by in the morning but they are consumers in the evening so pay rise would subsequently translate into higher consumer spending later on which will also boost more consumption and ad and real gdp in the economy right so there's a psychological impact of receiving a pay rise in this aspect as well also remember that so uh, also whether you so since you could sort of uh, when you are when the since the question assess the possible consequences of a rising rate of inflation for a country such as us you could conclude your answer by saying that you know we need to sort of also see the whether inflation is good or bad so this is an evaluation for inflation that i'm going to be telling you you can also apply it to it here as well for this six mark but only one or two points not more than that because it's a six mark question but in generally questions for inflation do come so i would give you a detailed evaluation of how to evaluate inflation questions because evaluating inflation means that you need to comment on the fact that whether inflation is good or bad so the fact that whether inflation is good or bad depends upon what what's the nature of the inflation whether it's demand pull or cost push inflation cost push inflation is undesirable but demand pull inflation especially if the rate of inflation is low and stable is desirable and low and it does more good than bad we know that but cost push inflation we know is accompanied by a fall in real gdp leading to stagflation and hence it is deemed to be worse than demand pull inflation uh, which if, if on the other hand if demand pull inflation is controlled can be beneficial and is an indicator basically you write this down that's an indicator of a healthy economy uh also it depends upon whether inflation is good or bad depends upon whether inflation is temporary or a persistent problem right whether it's temporary or a te it's it's sort of temporary or it's a persistent problem because um a temporary rise in let's say a small a temporary spike in gas or oil prices can cause inflation uh, cost push inflation but that can settle down later later as well because maybe if gas and oil prices are rising right now it could settle down later as well now you don't need to sort of right now as far as the us question is concerned for this case study you don't need to write this point because they haven't really talked about gas or oil prices here but you can and you cannot it depends on you but like i said i want to take this opportunity to tell you a lot about inflation content here right so also remember that but so if it depends upon you know if it's a temporary rise in oil and gas prices it, it would settle down on its own so there's no need for you know probably the central bank or the monetary authorities to kick in and come with contractionary policies if they know that it will settle down on its own in a period's time right also uh the fact that the 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 fact that how bad inflation is on people's welfare depends upon uh the bargaining powers of the workers maybe if, if if we have strong trade unions then wages will increase in line with inflation right and if they are increasing then it's not a big problem for their welfare right also remember how bad the inflation is also depends upon whether nominal interest rates on let's say savings and loans can keep pace with inflation and if those nominal interest rates are keeping pace with inflation then people might not be worse off and their real value of savings will not erode uh because if if the interest rates are going up in line with inflation then also remember that like i said it depends upon the rate of inflation whatever how bad or good inflation is and even you could write this point for the us economy as well that you know how good or bad the inflation would be for the us economy would depend upon the rate of inflation although monetary authorities over here are concerned with the 5% rate and that is why tightening monetary policy is there to you know is kicked in by the central bank because the uh, targeted inflation rate is 2% and they are right now at 5.4% in june 2021 which is a concern for the monetary authorities that is why contractionary monetary policy has been implemented which means that a high rate of inflation beyond targets is bad for the economy so but you could say that a low rate of inflation is deemed okay especially if it's stable there won't be there would be cost even then there would be cost but not as much there would be bearable right we are concerned about unbearable cost that is where the monetary authorities it rings the doorbells of the monetary authorities um in fact you could say that a low demand level of demand per inflation may have more benefits than cost but you could say that if the rate of inflation is high and rampant you know there's a reason why constantly i'm using these words because i want you to write these words down and so that you can sort of implement them in your ci exam as well and if you are writing them down please let me know in the comments so that i feel motivated so if the rate is high and rampant then the cost to the economy would particularly be quite high because in that case the risk of uh, inflationary spirals and the risk of price spirals and the problems of inflationary noise would be quite severe if that rate is like i said if the rate is high and rampant then the cost to the economy especially with the risk of price spirals and the problem of inflationary noise will quite be severe right 
also remember that if the inflation it it also depends upon the stability of the figure not only about the rate but also about the stability remember that fluctuating rates constant fluctuating volatile rates are not desirable at all because unstable inflation remember leads to worsening of the inflationary noise because it is difficult for consumers and firms to understand the signaling function of the prices and what that does is it makes it harder like i said before as well it makes it harder for them to plan you know for them to plan ahead and make uh, you know consumption and uh, investment decisions and that just causes more uncertainty and and also remember that you could also say that it also depends whether inflation is anticipated versus unanticipated now a lot of people write in the exam that anticipated inflation is not a problem but that's that's wrong because they don't really understand what do you what do you really mean by anticipated or anticipated inflation remember that anticipated high inflation is very dangerous yes i'm correct anticipated high inflation is very dangerous for an economy because what happens is that if the inflation is anticipated workers will push for wage spiral i mean workers will push for higher wages right now because they're anticipating a higher rise in the future and which will result into wage price spirals and if consumers are anticipating inflation they will start spending right now which will result in consumer price spirals so with anticipated high inflation it is very dangerous because the wage price spirals and consumer price spirals are much more likely to occur and then it becomes very difficult and the problem with this is it becomes very difficult for the economy to get out of them and that is that become that becomes uncontrollable then that is how the severity of the problem is right it could probably be hyperinflationary then as well and at the same time unanticipated sudden and unanticipated inf- inflation is also not really good for the economy i mean and don't say anticipated is good both are not good and the con- i mean the way you will explain it, it is very different unanticipated you will say that it is un- if it is unanticipated and sudden unanticipated sudden increases in inflation is not good for the confidence of the economy basically not good for the economy in terms of confidence because it just shatters the confidence especially for businesses where they're like what the hell is happening because their cost just gets out of control so at the same time like i said unanticipated sudden increase in inflation is not good for the economy and it could lead to a decline in real gdp real income and consumer spending as well and falling investment for of the businesses as well so yeah guys that's about it i uh, would like to end here but there's one more point that uh, comes to just came in my head that it also depends whether the economy was previously whether inflation is beneficial or harmful depends upon whether the economy was previously in a recession and is recovering or not um you could say that uh, you could say that maybe this demand for inflation for the us might not be much of a concern especially because the economy in the us was previously hit because in a recession and it was sort of recovering from covid and that was the initial plan of the government to inject 6 trillion um so probably that was not much of a problem that should not be much of a problem especially if it's demand pull inflation um and the economy was recovering from covid and they were sort of recovering from that recessionary phase so it should not be a problem but the monetary authorities are concerned because here the problem is that here us is not only suffering from demand pull they are sort of that is accompanied with cost push as well so yes now if we take the us example out of the equation then we could write in the exam in a paper 2 section c essay that whether inflation is harmful or not depends upon if the economy was previously in a recession and is recovering or not because if if let's say you make the keynesian aggregate supply curve and you say that you know if the economy is at y1 right now which it means that it is quite far away from the full employment level of output then there is a huge negative output gap there is huge spare capacity which is an indication that your economy is has a lot of unemployed resources so if let's say the inflation goes up from ad1 to let's say ad goes up and then inflation goes up from p1 to p2 then this increase in inflation might not be a problem in fact it will be healthy because uh, it will reduce that negative output gap and increase real gdp for the economy right so again it depends upon what perspective you are taking in the exam so that's about it guys I really enjoyed doing this case study i hope you guys uh, make the best of it and just just comment and share share this case study with as much people as you can so that all of them understand how to attempt case those case studies and they can also benefit from the content that i have created thank you so much guys all the best